risk taking is being rewarded in the system. Even if you fail in the risk taking, they say we reward you 3 million instead of 10 million when your company is bankrupt, we bought over by another company. So the attitude of the top management and the seniors to the junior makes these people work over time and take risks. It's not their money, it's the investor's money or somebody else's money. The interest you say you play with this money. If you succeed and make a lot of money, we'll give you a bonus. If you don't succeed, it doesn't matter, we'll give you a smaller bonus. So how do you expect people, young people, to observe the ethics of the game, to say, I will not do this, and I will succeed if I can, but what you say is not correct, I will not back the wrong horse that you want me to back, I will not go for the long round horse, the high risk bit, this may very good. But you say, but everybody is doing it, and if I don't do it, what's use of keeping you, and throw you out and get somebody else. So it's a kind of a risk, high risk market for professionals to play in high risk uh, situations. And therefore it spreads and everybody says, everybody is doing it, why can't I do it? And if I succeed, I get more bonus, if I don't succeed, I get small bonus. So that is how the, the management should have a view, along with the top uh, people and board of directors, how far do we want to go, how far do we want to stop. But if the rules of the game are framed in such a way that uh, the more risk you take, the more profit you make, more reward you get. But more risk you take, you fail, never mind, and still you lose reward a smaller bonus. And everybody takes a chance on the high risk game in building. I want young professionals joining these companies at the age of 20, 29, 30, being given $200 million, $300 million to play with and say, produce a profit, let us see. If you don't produce a profit, it doesn't matter. They give you a smaller bonus. That is how things started in the early days and it's going on. And the 2008 crisis also was a lot of people went into this high risk game. And they knew housing, but if people can't afford to take a loan, people are given. In India, the situation, I'm afraid, to digress a bit. In India, we are now saying everybody should get a bank loan. The bankers said they're not credit worthy. How can I give them money? No, no, but you must give them money. So if you force the banks and public sector or private banks in India to give money, where their own assessment and evaluation does not justify a loan, then I think we are heading the same way of getting a large number of uh, loans which are unpaid, bad loans, high risk factors of this. What is your take on the kind of board uh, related uh, collapses, uh, board failures, uh, board not to, uh, doing the kind of work that they should do, uh, the lack of diligence, and all of these things, what, what advice do you have to the board? See, the rules are two things. The rules have been trained already on these. Nobody follows the rules. Uh, two things I wanted to say. Now, all the students ask me a question. Uh, what about the Dodd Frank Act? Dodd Frank Act is now a belated attempt to do what should have been done 20 years ago. But it's so cumbersome. I don't know if you have read the book or seen the book. I have not even seen it, but I have read about it. 938 pages. They have to frame 390 regulations have to be framed. And what was the number of uh, pages in uh, Glass Steagall? Maybe 13 or 14. No, 14. That's right. The original Glass Steagall Act, which uh, was repealed by Clinton and came back. Yes, 16 pages. Yeah. Right. Uh, 16 pages of something. And the same thing was repeated in Dodd Frank in 900. 938 pages and 120 regulations that will frame. Now, there are 390 regulations that frame. They so far framed only 110 regulations. And they say two year time is over, it was July 2010, July 2012, two year period is over, but nowhere near it. And it's the most cumbersome, most detailed rules are being sought to be framed. Just because you got hit badly in the 2008 crisis, you want to tighten the screw so much that the screw breaks or your hand breaks. So it's an old reaction to a situation. Many people are critical of this dodd Frank Act. You don't have a, 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 a frame, a rules to be framed in America where the SEC has been in operation since 1934. It's not a new body of framing regulations for it. Not like uh, Sebi where I went in and said the clean snake is framed for things. It has been in operation from 1934, a Security State Commission Act. And now in 2010, you want to frame 900 pages and 390 regulations. You will tie the hands of everybody and you will paralyze the whole system. I think one of these days people are going to raise this subject and say, clean the system and don't have such an elaborate uh, uh, piece of legislation called uh, the uh, 
outside, and out like that. But as part of that, uh, Volker has introduced his own conditions in one of the sections there. Or it has the question also, what is Volker rule? Volker rule really says there should be a limit on the extent of risk that a bank takes in dealing on behalf of its clients or in dealing with hedge funds and private equity funds. So they put a limit of 3% of tier 1 capital, a limit up to which the bank can play on proprietary trading and 3% on the trading for hedge funds and private equity. Within that, there are sub clauses and clauses and exemptions available that even Volker doesn't know exactly what his recommendation will lead to eventually, but they're not working on it now. It takes some more time. So it's extracted from the Dodd Frank Act as a Volker rule. There is a 3% rule. 3% is the limit of the bank's equity they can use for private trading or for hedge fund or for this. Uh, so it's getting very confused. It's a wrong solution for the wrong problem, and I don't think it will work. Did SEBI have any hand uh, in suggesting the kind of audit auditors that companies should hire? Or is it not at all a service mandate? Well, the space was already occupied for the last several years in the Companies Act. The auditors are appointed under the Companies Act and there's a rotation of auditors. But now there are a list of auditors, and each company has to select a list of auditors or a given list approved by the company's entry from the board. So they follow that, and we didn't want to enter on a new area which we are not getting into. We had problems of our own. So we didn't go into that. Uh, but could you, could you enforce a, a rule about auditors now? You know, much of the collapse came through auditors from Anderson, from Korea, in India. Does uh, SEBI have any mandate, uh, uh, or do you have an advice? Take, take, take the case of Satyam, you are on the board, the audit board. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's been I, spite, I, it's I asked you not to mention this. <laughs> 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 and I think, I give you credit for it. You're the only one who objected to what took place in the board. And say it, say it to your credit. Yeah. How many Dr. Srinivasan do you have sitting on boards of big companies who raised the flag and said, don't do it and let the right thing be done? You are a very rare person doing that. Most people wouldn't do that. They have sailed along with majority. They gave them a lot of remuneration. They gave them all. You didn't succumb to any of that and you raised the red flag at the right time. But in spite of that, some people escaped. The price order house was penalized to the price of the peanuts. That was done for them. And uh, so, the uh, question is, do people act ethically and within certain standards which should be uniformly applied to everyone? If they are not doing that, if people deliberately violate the rule, then you will have this recurrence in any situation. In America or in India, you will have this. I also want to ask you an important question, which you discuss quite a bit uh, in your blogs, in your interviews, and also in uh, the book. Uh, that your your powers are without teeth, without claws, and uh, you can uphold it, but you can't enforce it. And uh, there are no uh, punitive uh, regulations attached to it. Now, that being the case, um, not only yourself, but uh, we learned last week about ONGC. If you all remember, Professor Ramanujam was talking a lot about LIC's uh, uh, role. Buying LIC bailed out ONGC basically. Bailing out and you know, government buying, government selling. And now uh, I had a conversation with uh, an IRDA commissioner. He tells me we objected to it. Now he doesn't cut it. Now they say they we protested very strongly. In SEBI, uh, would that be the case? You protest very strongly and can't do anything about it? In some cases that would be true, but in other cases you can still go ahead and act. In a case like this, 
where you have a public sector company and another public sector company and the question of buying or supporting the other company is all in the hands of the government because the boards of the public sector enterprises are wholly controlled by the government people. They are not independent boards. Neither ONGC board nor LIC board is an independent board. Like Satyam. Satyam is an independent board. And these are all government controlled companies, means the majority, substantial majority of people on the board are government nominees. So in such a situation, they take orders from the government and say, you support this decision of LIC, you support this decision of ONGC. So, the, so that's a common feature of all public sector. Another reason which I raised some time ago when I was in this investment commission, I said, even in government companies, why don't you have representation for 20 or 30 percent of the shares that you want to sell to the public? Give them representation on the board. They are collecting 30 percent of the share capital from the public, but gave no representation on the board to the public representative to sit on the board. And I went to, I made some noise on it and they finally agreed to give one or two places. But it's all handpicked to your own people. So you don't have an independent board even where 10, 20 percent of the shares have been sold to the public. And 80 percent are with the government, the boards are entirely in the hands of the government. And they tell them to support this, they support it. I have uh, two questions which I'm going to reserve to the end because the students have worked very hard and they want to take advantage of the fact you are here sitting among us and ask the questions. Then I'll come back. Before they go to the study type questions, there was somebody who came and talked to me yesterday uh, and said, I would like to ask in terms of Mr. Ramakrishna's very uh, broad and wide ranging experience and skills and also that you had also um, had uh, uh, commented about Enron and the coal uh, and the energy sector where you and I could have served together and all of these various things are going on. Uh, uh, the student asked me if she could ask you about energy self-sufficiency and if you don't have it, what happens for everything, including regulation. And I call upon Gargi. Are you here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. What's your question? So my question is, uh, on global energy shifting, currently India imports most of its oil and uh, uh, in future also I believe India will have to import because of the demand. But if you see the trends, I believe that North America is becoming self-sufficient in, uh, I mean they are producing their own energy like their uh, gas or powers or uh, oil. So I would like to know, uh, but I would, I would like to know that uh, the difference in the current, uh, uh, currently is that Gulf nations are the prominent oil uh, producing countries. In future, these uh, focus will shift to North America. So I would like to know what will be the impact on India on this shifting, that go global energy shifting, because I believe that oil is uh, underlined of lots of derivatives and there will be lots of impact in the stock exchange and how would India cope up this situation? What do you suggest? Like, what is your vision on this? Did you hear the question? Yes. Yes. You did. Do you understand the question? <laughs> no, let, me, the question. Let, let me, let me try to tell you what I understand from the question. You are probably referring to the recent news item. Yeah. yeah. That North America is going to be a major exporter of oil and gas. They were to the shade. Yes. And they mentioned North Dakota. Yeah. The place where the boom comes now, where they don't get huge amounts, and they have replaced Saudi Arabia, and they have several times, four times the reserves of Saudi Arabia, which is not something about the top. Exactly, and by 2035, there's going to be the self sufficient oil exporter. Yeah, and there will be net exporters to the world, and yeah, Saudi exactly. Arabia will not. So I asked North Dakota, what is the capital of North Dakota? I asked an American. He said, We don't know. So North Dakota is a center of attraction. People just go there, live in a tent, and collect $100,000 on any job. So people are all going like the gold rush days, they're going for the Russian North Dakota, maybe one or two other states. Now the effect on India, we are more and more dependent on imported fuel energy. Yes. How do I have to take gas or oil? Whatever it is, yes sir. You're only shifting the source of your import from Saudi Arabia to North America. 
but you will be in a better position. The more suppliers with buyers, you can probably bargain for lower prices. How skillful you develop, and you have to deal with it. I've read in the book about my interview with Jay Jamani in uh, Saudi Arabia, and I went to talk, talk to him about oil need, oil supplies. You can then ask for a lower price for the oil if you go to Saudi Arabia. So you've been suppliers to us for a long time. And the Middle East companies are suppliers to us. 80% of the imports come from the Middle East. So they can then give us better prices. But uh, beyond better prices, you will have availability, competitive availability at lower prices because of North American oil. I think they will commit to the market in a big way and get out of the dependent of Saudi Arabia in the next three or four years. Yes. Actually, they are, I, what I have read that they are planning this thing long back and they are trying to be self-sufficient long time ago because they know that this oil is I mean, yeah. dominant, uh, dominated by the Muslim countries, if you see. And they are not in a good relationship with America. So I, I believe that there will be some major shift and if you see the political environment also, there will be some changes. Uh, if we can go to the next and you know, yeah. later on uh, we can converse on that. Uh, the, there's a, a group of uh, students who have circulated questions and I would ask them uh, to ask you start your questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, sir. Uh, sir, we have read about SEBI's investor education and awareness through impanelled resource persons. So, sir, my question has two parts. Uh, what is the progress we have made with respect to this initiative of SEBI? And the other is what measures SEBI is adopting with respect to educating investors, especially in terms of uh, complex financial instruments? Uh, let, let me ask you to repeat the question, those who mm -hmm. claim to have heard it. Because he is in the middle, I can't know anything. Anyone who has heard it? Did you hear a question? Jyoti, Jyoti, Jyoti. Yes, yes. come back. As far as I know, university education program gets high priority in SEBI and has been getting high priority in SEBI. But off late, we are getting more and more complex products in the market. Therefore, it's more difficult to analyze the implications of the complex product. You take, for instance, the derivatives. In fact, I tried to introduce derivatives, the substitute for Bandar trading when I left SEBI. And I had one or two discussion papers and one or two seminars. And then subsequently, the futures and options uh, the exchange has come. They are doing derivatives trading now. They are going to. So more than that, if you get into more complex type of product, I would say it is slippery ground. It's the same slippery ground that they got into in 2006, 2007, 2008. They got into all kinds of funny new ideas, interest swaps, and all the other things, you know. And if you follow the Western, capital market in that direction. Uh, very difficult to educate investors, more difficult for investors to follow it, and more, even more difficult for investors not to be hurt by getting into new areas. You don't need new kind of risk all the time. You have enough risk available, you have a variety of products all the You don't have to follow the rest, the rest of the risk. It's not there in every country. Would that help, uh, you know, um, our common friend, Pakibala? Yeah. Yes, we have to Every time when there's a budget, he would go around the country educating everybody. He would talk about it. He would talk about what the implication is for you, uh, you know, if you do not uh, know what's happening, how the budget process takes place and so on. Is there any kind of program like that in SEBI going around telling people to be uh, aware and beware of uh, what do you have, anything like that? Yeah, as far as I know, SEBI is only frequent seminars on certain types of uh, product of which investors can invest. It's more an activity of the investors themselves to get together, get experienced people to come and speak to them. Say we should support that activity, they have been supporting that activity. 
I don't know the latest picture of how many seminars they have held and how many people they have educated, but the process started some years ago when I was there and been going on as far as I know. Good evening, sir. Sir, just add to Jyoti's point, sir, is that the reason they have now banned the mini Nifty futures um, from SEBI, I mean, from trading in the capital markets? Because in 2007, they introduced mini Nifty futures uh, so that to, I mean, attract uh, retail investors to the market. Now the SEBI is, I mean, completely uh, doing a turnaround of what it, it had done in 2007 because now they are disapproving their own point that uh, since these products require a lot of investor education and small retail investors shouldn't be exposed to these kind of products so they are withdrawing this I mean only for the uh, I mean the contracts that are yet to expire they should continue trading and rest I mean no new contracts should be introduced into the market I don't know the latest is maybe because they are going to protect the investors from themselves but if investors want to take a high risk in trading it's a commodity they are taking that risk so they are saying don't blame us if you get hurt in this small investors because you have no avenues of investment the other thing you should recognize is that uh, investors should not get into the kind of situation where the Americans are going into now. They are going into 2006, 7, 8 and the collapse started. See, when you go into different products with different types of risk bearing capacity, of investors are not at that capacity of risk bearing at all levels. And the American investors didn't put their own money. They borrowed from everybody who was more than willing. If you knew how to sign your name on a piece of paper, they'd give you a loan in America. That's how it happens, well documented. And that is how they get into quite the trouble also. If you tell anybody here, you can't sign a piece of paper, I'll give you a loan. Anybody will buy. And the banks are told, don't worry, you lend them, I'll back you up. And who backed up? Eventually the bill came to Federal Reserve Board and also the PIC, insurance and all that day. Uh, they gave close to a trillion dollars out of that troubled asset program. So you don't encourage excessive risk taking by giving all kinds of facilities. Because then they eventually the buck stops with the government and government will have to bear the cost as it happened in India. And other people have to bear the cost. Money goes to somebody's hands, it's not going to thin air. Nobody has made money. But the average person, house owner has lost money, the capital has gone. Bank also has lost its money. AIG has the uh, biggest support came to AIG. AIG is the biggest losers. Okay. So digressing from the SEBI, I would like to come back to the point of load frank. You have already answered our question like this act has been in fact a cumbersome one and is the wrong solution to the correct problem. So I would say not even it has paralyzed, but as for many financial experts, it has not only paralyzed, but it has prolonged the recession. Because there were certain objectives with which this act was framed. Some of them were like to put an end to too big to fail and to protect American uh, taxpayers by ending bailouts to these institutions and to protect consumers from abusive financial practices. But sir, to implement this act, a uh, financial apparatus was created under which various financial bodies were proposed and some of them were sir, a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Office of Financial Research and Financial Stability Oversight Council. So all these uh, uh, bodies in the apparatus would be definitely supported by Fed and definitely it has some cost. So uh, this apparatus, I mean this act is mostly financial institutions and in fact innovation is getting stiffer in the market. So, so uh, do you think I mean it's not even, I mean it has prolonged the uh, recovery of I mean, global economy? Yeah, I think so. The very fact that they got the uh, uh, track act at 930 pages shows that they are barking up the wrong tree and too late. Uh, the CC has been there from 1934. They haven't taken anything to protect people in a simpler way. And now after this 2008,